Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called Show Me the Money. It's by Stuff National Correspondent Steve Kilgallen, who joins me now. Hi, Steve. Hi, Michael. Uh, So, Show Me the Money sounds like a nice, light-hearted, Jerry Maguire-esque romp, um, but it's pretty much the opposite. Uh, Firstly, this story is part of a series that you spent months reporting, so uh, tell us about that first. Yep. um, The the genesis of it was a series of stories I did a couple of years ago about a Catholic priest in Auckland called Satiki Ras, who had groomed a 15-year-old girl, and the church's response to it was, was really poor. And that sort of put me in touch with a, a group called the Network of Survivors of, who were survivors of um, Catholic Church sexual abuse. And I realized there was some wider stories to be told. And I thought that historically, journalists have reported single stories of people's abuse. And I wanted to thread a whole lot of them together and see the patterns there. And I've particularly focused on two groups, the Marist Brothers and the Marist Fathers, who are two um, groups within the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is very fractured and has lots of different groups, but uh, one is a group of priests, the other group of brothers, but they're sort of loosely related. And they're, they've had a huge role in New Zealand society because they've run a lot of schools. So about 9% of Kiwis have had a Catholic education. And if you've had a Catholic education, it was probably one branch of the Marist that gave you it. They've also had, set up a huge network of old boys sporting clubs, so... Uh, Sonny Bill Williams played rugby league for the Marist yeah. Rugby League Club yeah. in Auckland, for example. So they've had a massive influence. So I wanted to really look at what what they've done with that influence, I guess. And so this story specifically is about money or compensation, in quote marks, when it comes to abuse in the Catholic Church and within those those Marist Brothers orders. Um, so talk us through that. What exactly you honed in on in, in this particular story? Yeah, sure. So this is the second in the series. And I was very interested in money because you read stories overseas, and I've talked a little about that, of huge compensation payments being made to victims of Catholic Church sexual abuse. But it's never happened that way here. Um, No survivors have got huge settlements here. I, I don't think there's any that have got anything into the six figures. And I wanted to explore why. And it's particularly relevant in the Maris context because the Maris are, are hugely wealthy. They own lots of land and properties and things like the uh, Mission Estate Vineyard and uh, commercial buildings, and yet the money they've paid out is, is, is really quite small. I wanted to explain why that is. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, let's get into it, but um, before we do, a couple of caveats. There's a little bit of strong language in this story, um, and be aware that the story, as you will have gathered covers sexual abuse, and you're going to hear from some victims. So every time you hear a name of someone who is a survivor of sexual abuse, that name will be a pseudonym. Now, here is Steve reading his story, Show Me the Money. Waiheke Island, 2002. Robbie West is not in a good way. He's taking a lot of methamphetamine, drinking heavily, but trying valiantly to tidy up his life. After nearly 30 years, he's realised that the recurring nightmares that keep pushing him back to drink and drugs are actually painful memories he's been working hard to bury. Having tried through police and lawyers to get redress and compensation for the abuse he suffered at the hands of his school teacher, a man we cannot name for legal reasons, he's now turned to his teacher's religious order, the FMS Marist Brothers. West shows up with his counsellor at a small church hall in Oniroa, the main town on the Gulf Island, where he's met by brothers Henry Spinks and Richard Dunleavy, who between them handled the Maris brothers' compensation settlements for over 20 years. It was so creepy, West says now, two decades later, the creepiest thing I've ever been involved in. Even the counsellor that was with me, I looked at her, and her face was white. The whole thing was bizarre. The Marists had insisted West undergo counselling and promise he was clean of alcohol and drugs before they entered negotiations. That was a difficult proposition given West's chaotic life, one which had changed path 
when he enrolled at a Marist Brothers High School at the age of 11 and was placed in the classroom of a charismatic young teacher. West recalls the first time that teacher took him to the office at the back of the classroom and sexually abused him. He also remembers seeing it happen to other kids. The abuse began straight away, West says. Within the first week I was there. There was about eight months I endured of that on a weekly basis. That was pretty much the end of my schooling. West spent some of his teenage years in boys' homes in Australia and lived on the streets of Sydney. He spent his 18th birthday in Waikiria Prison near Hamilton and from then until he turned 40 he was, in his own words, on a binge and imprisonment lifestyle. Amid the drugs, West racked up 42 convictions, had two heroin detoxes, and enjoyed an enthusiastic engagement with the rave scene, which included importing ecstasy from Europe. I always thought the abuse was not real, he says, that it was a bad nightmare. I had these strange dreams. I often wondered if that stuff had happened, but then I would get blackout drunk. Brief spells of sobriety in rehab and prison allowed him the clarity to realise it really had all happened. He says he went to police, who told him his teacher had already been prosecuted and convicted for multiple counts of child sexual abuse, so it wasn't worth another attempt. He later learned police had tried to find him as a potential complainant. That was, to me, he says, a big realisation that something had happened. West consulted lawyers, who said a civil court case would be expensive and fruitless. So he contacted the Marists. The teacher confessed to them immediately, and after the Oniroa meeting, he was able to agree a settlement, even though he now admits that he was far from sober at the time. He received $15,000, which the Marists described as a concrete sign of regret and the same as the other victims of this offender. West says he spent it all on back rent, meth and alcohol. Not until a four-day hangover after his 40th birthday party did West quit drinking. Two years later, he weaned himself off meth and he's been clean for 15 years. Weekly counselling helps and he has some financial support from ACC. Life has completely changed, West says, but a lot of the memories of the abuse have become a lot more vivid. They stole the first 40 years of my life. West now feels that he was at a huge disadvantage during the negotiations with the Marists. He was mentally extremely fragile, had no legal advice, and felt pushed into accepting their terms. I've come to realize I was shot before I could walk, he says. As soon as they say the word lawyer, how can a broken sickness beneficiary compete with that? West has since asked the Marists to increase their compensation. They declined. It's not as if they haven't got any money, he says. They can pay huge sums for lawyers to crush some poor bloke whose life is ruined. Another survivor of the teacher's abuse, who suffered lifelong depression and anxiety as a result, told Stuff... It was a year of anguish, torture and pain. I was looking for the school gates from the first incident. I thought, fuck, I'd better get out of here. A former classmate of the teachers at the Maris Brothers Seminary, whose name is suppressed, gave the teacher a job. He's now retired. When Stuff approached him at his home, he said, No thanks, you're trespassing. I'm calling the police. In 2002, the Boston Globe newspaper's investigation into widespread abuse by the city's Catholic priests sparked a global reckoning of the church's long history of paedophilia and cover-ups. Since then, abuse survivors have come forward in their thousands, told their stories, and in many cases received compensation. Not an easy process when many offenders are dead, many countries had statute of limitation laws to hurdle, 
and the church proved a tough negotiator. But worldwide, survivors have recorded landmark victories. Last year, Irishman Tony Gribbon publicised his €100,000 payment from the Irish church. Too many people take an envelope and disappear, he says. But my point was exposure of the abuse and justice. In Scotland this February, there was a record £1.4 million settlement. Multi-million dollar payments have been commonplace in the US for two decades. And last November, the Australian branch of the Christian Brothers made a £3.7 million payout. But, like Robbie West, no survivor in New Zealand has come anywhere close to those numbers. Why? There's several reasons. First, a New Zealand legal system which lawyers and advocates say is overdue for an overhaul. Second, our unique ACC system, which curtails many routes to substantial payouts. Third, and perhaps most importantly, the New Zealand Catholic Church, to which both Marist groups belong, has actively worked to keep their payouts low. In 2002, as the wave of allegations hit, senior officials from Catholic organisations met in Wellington to talk about the looming issue of sexual abuse compensation claims. At that meeting, they agreed to keep settlements secret, to impose payment caps, and to insist that deals have a clause denying any legal liability. The minutes declared, our objective is not to evade any moral obligation we might have to redress injustices, but is to exercise responsible stewardship over the resources that have come mainly from the Catholic people. How the people feel about payments is a proper matter to take into consideration. The Catholic people have already contributed to the ACC fund set up by the government specifically to meet these needs. But even before the end of that year, the plan seemed to be breaking down. That's because horrific and widespread abuse suffered by pupils at the Marylands Boarding School in Christchurch, run by the Catholic Order, the Hospital of Brothers of St John of God, was exposed. Psychologist Michelle Mulverhill and Peter Burke the leader of the Australian-based John of Gods, toured the country agreeing payouts averaging $63,500. Mulverhill says these payments were much lower than they gave the Australian victims. The Kiwis, she says, were treated as second-class citizens, but it still broke the New Zealand church's payment cap and caused panic in the hierarchy. A memo from Auckland Bishop Pat Dunn to other church leaders argued they must urgently agree on a maximum level of payment for these abuse cases. We do not want to set a limit in Auckland and then find that some other diocese sets a different limit. Each time someone raises the goalpost, we are all under pressure to follow. I do not believe that we should ever publicise this agreed maximum amount, but it certainly would help if we could all be of one mind on what this maximum should be. Dunn said Auckland had forwarded the Maris Brothers cap of $12,000. But now they were heading towards the Maris father's maximum of $30,000. He wanted to distance the rest of the church from the expense of St John of God deals and included suggested talking points that the St John abuse was worse and the order had followed an Australian settlement scale. The Maris father's scale that Dunn talks about was first conceived in 2002 and had evolved by 2004 into a checklist based on the principle, said their leader, Tim Duckworth, that someone suing the order in civil court would be lucky to get $20,000, making a $30,000 upper limit relatively generous. A memo from Duckworth listed aggravating factors, youth, how serious the abuse was, violence, humiliation, and if the abuser was in loco parentis. He also listed mitigating factors, such as if an accused offender had a name for giving everyone sex talks, suggesting this gave a survivor an entree to discuss what had happened to them. Sexual harassment alone, he wrote, was not considered a reason for a payout. Actual touching is required.
The father's scale went from five thousand to thirty thousand dollars. And, said Duckworth, while I would never say this publicly because it would be misconstrued, anyone who had complained to them, but not the police, should receive a quick settlement to save costs and time. If the abuser were dead, then Duckworth wanted a small settlement, if that is necessary, because we cannot really accept one side of a case alone. This was to be pursued even if someone was known as a repeat offender. If it were to become known that all you had to do was say that Father X abused you during your time at St Trinian's and you received a payment of $10,000, then why would fraudsters not try it? Peter Haride of the Brothers said they too had a template of ideas for setting payments, but he wouldn't share it. He confirmed their cap was $20,000, but wouldn't say if it was still adhered to. In 2005, another meeting of church leaders again addressed the issue. Church lawyer Phil Hamlin told the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care it was, in light of settlements being made by Australian entities, that were far higher than what was being discussed in a New Zealand context. That gulf between Australian and New Zealand settlements has caused surprise across the Tasman. When Sydney lawyer Jason Moody represented Australian-based Kiwi Anna Thompson in a claim against the Maris brothers for abuse she suffered as a seven-year-old, he was stunned at the fishhooks of the New Zealand legal system and the paltry level of payouts. Anna was offered $5,000, Moody wrote to the Australian Maris Trust Board, telling them of this astonishing offer and asked if it was a matter of concern for them that New Zealand was not much on a par. He asked if they might reach out to the New Zealand Maris brothers and enlighten them. They declined. There was a lot of things like that where you'd think, what the f***? From Stuff, a new 12-part documentary podcast. He was into sex every day. The commune. Sex, drugs, and a guru called Bert. There are crimes, but this isn't a who done it, it's a why done it. Good God, adults agreed to this? The commune. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform or at stuff.co.nz slash the commune. You've already been welcome to Centre Point. When they offer $20,000 or $30,000, it's a joke says Graham Rush, who was sexually abused at the age of 12 by a notorious paedophile, Maris brother, Kevin Healy. Graham has a friend in Australia who received a million dollars. I was 12 years old and abused by him every single day I stepped into the school, Rush says. What price do you put on that? What price do you put on me going to jail? All my problems with relationships, the way I self-destructed. In his Royal Commission evidence, leader Tim Duckworth said the Marist fathers made payouts to 28 of 81 complaints received between 1947 and 2018. Those 28 payouts totaled just over $1 million. The highest was $50,000, the lowest $5,000. The average was about $35,700 per claim. In a statement... Duckworth told Stuff the Maris fathers had tried to be fair and equitable to claimants. They had taken advice on settlements from lawyers, counsellors, social workers and ACC specialists before setting an amount. Equity and fairness were key considerations, Duckworth said. Using the information received, guidelines were discussed to determine an appropriate amount, normally designated as ex gratia, to signify it was not the result of a legal or judicial process and was because, after an inquiry into the complaint, we, on the balance of probabilities, believed the sexual abuse had occurred and acknowledged the harm done to the survivor. Maris Brothers delegate Peter Haride told the Royal Commission that the brothers had paid out 57 cases, totalling $540,000, an average of about 9500 the brothers capped payments at $10,000 through the 1990s, then lifted the cap to 20000 Their biggest settlement was just over that, $23,000. This amount is frequently less than complainants were hoping to receive. In some cases, it is much less, 
her ride told the commission. Complainants sometimes see media about complainants in the United States or Australia receiving millions of dollars and come to the brothers expecting comparable amounts. The New Zealand system is not comparable to those jurisdictions, in part due to the ACC scheme. The church knew the law in New Zealand was stacked in its favour. That's why Jason Moody, the Australian lawyer, eventually advised his Kiwi complainant Anna to decline that $5,000 offer and closed her file. There is not much more we can do for you given the current laws in New Zealand, he told her. Anna has still to settle her case. Lawyer Sonia Cooper says there are lots of legal barriers to securing a large settlement through the courts. First, there's a time limit on reporting an offence, covered by the two Limitation Acts of 1950 and 2010. The 1950 Act allows a victim just two years after becoming an adult. Back in 1950, you were technically an adult at 20 to lodge a claim. So essentially, victims had until their 22nd birthday, at the latest, to make an allegation. Sonia Cooper says there's a couple of ways to evade that limit but neither have been widely used. Survivor Robbie West, the guy at that meeting in Onero on Waiheke Island, took almost 30 years to claim compensation. That's typical. Worldwide, the average reporting time for church sexual abuse survivors is more than two decades after the offending. Pat Cleary, a now deceased survivor who didn't disclose his abuse for over 40 years, once wrote, Shame is the easy answer for not coming forward. Shame for everything, even for being me. Sonia Cooper, who has 30 years' experience handling institutional sexual abuse claims and was an expert witness at the Royal Commission, describes the Limitation Acts as a tool to silence survivors and deny their claims, and then say, We've been so good giving you this paltry sum of money for all these horrendous things we did to you. The church isn't obliged to lean on the Limitation Act, Cooper says. It could simply declare it wouldn't use that defence and instead fight any case on its merits. We are challenging people now, she says. With the shift to a survivor-based focus, is it appropriate for you to rely on a defence that's based on your choice? Why should you be relying on these legal defences that allow you to pay a pittance? Peter Haride of the Brothers said he accepted they had relied on the Limitation Act, but said he didn't have the legal background to comment on why. Cooper hopes the Royal Commission will recommend changes to the Limitation Act. Without the time barrier, she would have hundreds of cases ready to file. The bar has been removed in most Australian states, in Scotland, and in England there is more discretion applied. About half of US states have also removed it, despite a $10 million legal campaign by New York bishops to retain a five-year limit. The next barrier is ACC, the Accident Compensation Corporation, which provides funded counselling and small disability payments to sexual abuse survivors like Robbie West. New Zealand's universal ACC coverage means it's almost impossible for survivors to mount claims for exemplary damages against an abuser, or for vicarious liability by their employer. Even in cases where, for example, a known abuser was shifted to another location and allowed to keep offending. The Marists are well aware of all these defences. In response to one claimant in 2018, Marist Brothers lawyer Robert Burns raised ACC as a legal barrier and said, we cannot see how the Limitation Act could be overcome. He also denied vicarious liability on the grounds that the particular abuse happened in the victim's home when the brothers involved were effectively off duty. A similar defence was used by the Marist fathers way back in 1979 to deny liability for serial paedophile Alan Woodcock because he was off duty when he abused a boy in his Marist-provided home. So the church knows it would likely prevail in court. Every Marist settlement seen by stuff has included a clause saying the payment is voluntary and the Marists have advice any legal claims would fail. That gives them huge leverage. A 2022 Maris Brothers settlement says they have legal advice which would indicate the order may have no legal responsibility in respect of the claims made for compensation or damages. 
The absence of employer liability appears to have shaped the language they use. Both Maris groups are careful never to use the word compensation, except to point out that they don't pay compensation. At the Royal Commission, Peter Haride of the Maris Brothers said, What we are trying to achieve here is to offer a token, a symbol, that we regret what harm has been done. We are not offering compensation and we don't use that language. The word, he said, would introduce an obligation to set right that harm caused by abuse and they wanted to avoid that obligation. Earlier this year, he wrote to one survivor's family declaring that the church doesn't favour the language of compensation. Haride repeated that position to Stuff. We don't talk about compensation. We're offering an ex gratia, which is a token of our regret. He hoped their payouts were life-changing in some small way. Haride said a Royal Commission report on redress payments was due, and he didn't want to queer the pitch by talking in detail. I know where your questions are coming from. You've got headline grabbing large amounts as compensation from overseas, where the environment might be different, the legal system might be different. We find it difficult to make that comparison. Likewise, the Marist father's then leader, Phil Cody, wrote to a survivor in 2005 saying they did not make and have never made compensation payments in respect of sexual abuse, but they do make ex gratia gifts. It's a consistent theme. They were very clear that this was a gift, not a payment, says Sarah Jones, who was offered $10,000 by the Maris brothers for seven years of abuse from the age of four by brother Bede Francis Fitton. I felt like I was being put in my place, she says, and should be happy with what I got. There's one more tool that the New Zealand church has used when explaining why its payouts are so low. It cries poor. When survivor John Wilson wrote to the Maris brothers Peter Haride rejecting a $20,000 settlement and pointing out that as a trustee, Haride had just signed off accounts showing equity of $167 million, Haride told him that was an oversimplified narrative. Wilson says that when Haride visited him at home, He was told how the brothers lived off donations. It was, he said, a sob story. Then John looked at their accounts. Don't sit here and give me a sob story when you're actually doing well, he tells Stuff now. I'm still in a rental home at 53 years old, and you're in a million dollar home and don't have to worry about your rent. In 2018, when Maris Brothers lawyer Robert Burns wrote to one abuse survivor offering a $5,000 settlement, he wrote that his client was a charitable trust It does not have extensive wealth and is to a degree constrained as to how funds within its control are expended. In 2002, the Marist father's discussion of compensation limits talked of protection of assets sufficient to provide for the fathers. Asked about it at the Royal Commission, their leader, Tim Duckworth, explained they needed enough to carry on their ministry and what they were doing for the people and also to ensure they didn't, quote, have to say to everyone, sorry, There's no money for food from now on. Stuff estimates their combined worth at about $400 million. The brothers have $10 million in the bank and $19.8 million in an investment portfolio with Hobson Wealth Partners. Their school assets are valued at $97 million and the combined CVs of their remaining properties are about $21 million. Pies and soft drinks are particularly good business for them. Their school tuck shops alone returned a profit of over $313,000, and their last annual profit was over $2.5 million. The fathers, meanwhile, have almost $15 million in cash and term deposits, and list their assets at over $32 million. But their vast property portfolio encompasses a six-hectare forest, cable station in Marlborough, and 31 properties in Auckland, Wellington and Whangarei with combined CVs of over 133 million. And the jewel is the Mission Estate Vineyard. Last year, it sold $17 million worth of wine. A premium ticket for its annual concert featuring artists such as Elton John and the Beach Boys goes for $652. The ranks of both the Maris brothers and fathers are thinning. 
There were just 104 fathers and 55 brothers, 159 in total, left to share in this vast wealth. In a statement, Duckworth said some of the Maris father's assets were not realisable, their three schools were more a liability than an asset, and the father supported youth agencies, social services, parishes and crisis outreaches. Peter Haride said it was out of his pay grade to discuss the brothers' assets. We are not oblivious to what you are talking about, he said, referring to using their assets to increase payouts. But, on the other hand, I'm not going to make a comment. Survivor Sarah Jones, the one who was offered $10,000 by the brothers for seven years of abuse from the age of four, asks a simple question. Why don't they take the property and sell it and divide it among the victims? That was Show Me The Money on The Long Read From Stuff, written and read by Steve Kilgallen and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Jack Price. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listen via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on The Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening. 